Welcome back to Logic 101, I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is a hard replacement rule problem. The example that we did earlier in this unit is nothing in comparison to what we're looking at here, so best of luck to you as you try to work this one out on your own. And the problem that we have today is to show that this is true. So on the left side of this biconditional, we have if P then begin parentheses, if Q then R end parentheses. And I claim to you that that is the same thing as saying if Q then begin parentheses, if P then R end parentheses. This is known as commutivity of implications. But unlike the other forms of commutivity that we've seen, this one is not at all intuitively obvious. So if you want to verify that this is true, the standard way of doing it would be to get out that old truth table and start getting to work on it. But that's going to be a little bit of work because we have a whole bunch of different logical operators here and we have three separate simple sentences p q and r so that means we're going to have eight rows and goodness knows how many columns to work on if we were to go the truth table route the other way of doing this is to use pre-existing replacement rules replacement rules that we know are true to rewrite the first half of the biconditional as the second half of the biconditional and if we can do that then we verify that this is in fact true without using the truth table so I want to do that second way of doing this using the replacement rules to get from step one to step two, because that's a lot less work and a lot less grunt work than getting out that truth table. It's going to be a little bit difficult because this is going to require step-by-step -step thinking, but this is something you're going to eventually need to learn how to do anyway. So this is a good practice for that as well. So my claim to you again is that you can rewrite the top if P then begin parentheses, if Q then R, end parentheses, as what you see on the bottom, if Q then, begin parentheses, if P then R, end parentheses. And as it turns out, you only need six steps in between there to get from point one to point eight. So this is where I'm going to now invite you to pause this lecture and really think about this and figure out how to go step by step using replacement rules that we've seen before to rewrite what you see in line one and turn it eventually into what you see on line eight. So go ahead and try this one out on your own. This is a little bit difficult. And if you need a hint, then I'm going to give it to you right now. So my hint to you, if you're struggling on this, is to think about what is different between line one and line eight. So you see that line one has P and then Q, line eight has Q then P. That's the only difference between them is the ordering. And we know how to change the ordering of two simple sentences. We saw that before in commutivity. That was the basic commutivity using disjunctions, conjunctions, and biconditionals. So we can't simply flip P and Q here because we have a conditional. We don't have a commutivity, a simple commutivity rule for conditionals, but we do have them for conjunctions, disjunctions, and biconditionals. So my super special hint to you here is that we can remember back to material implication, that replacement rule. You can change implications into disjunctions using material implication. And once you have disjunctions, you can then flip the orderings of simple sentences using commutation. So that's my hint to you. If you struggled at first to do this one on your own, now pause again and think about how you would do this. But if you're ready for me to reveal the answer, again, my line of thinking here is that I need to turn the implications into disjunctions. And once I've turned those implications into disjunctions, I can then play around with the ordering and hopefully flip the P and the Q around. And as it turns out, this works exactly like that. So starting with line two, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change line one by applying material implication to the implication outside of the parentheses. So I turn the arrow between P and the parentheses statement to uh, disjunction. We have a V there now, and I put a negation in front of the P. So line two is not P or the implication Q then R. 
I still have an implication here, though. I can't just fool around with the P and the Q ordering. I can't commute those quite yet because I still have a disjunction and I still have parentheses wrapped around. Or rather, I still have an implication and I still have parentheses wrapped around that implication. So I need to apply material implication to what we see inside of the parentheses. So again, I negate the antecedent and I replace the arrow with a V. So we have the disjunction of not Q and R on the inside of the parentheses, which gives us not P or, begin parentheses, not Q or R. And again, I have just used material implication on the inside from line two to get to line three. All right, well, now this is where you might start wanting to switch the ordering of P and Q or the negations of P and Q, but we can't quite do that just yet because Q is on the inside, not Q is on the inside of the parentheses, and not P is on the outside of the parentheses. But we know by association, you can switch the parentheses freely among disjunctions. So we have two disjunctions here, which means you can very simply change where the parentheses go. Instead of having them wrapped around not Q and R, you can wrap them around not P and not Q. So by association, you can rewrite line three as line four, which is the parentheses not P or not R and parentheses, or rather not P or not Q and parentheses or R. And now that we've done that, now that we have both not P and not Q inside of the parentheses, we can flip the ordering of those two around. So by commutation, we have in the parentheses not Q or R, and then outside of the parentheses or R. So we've successfully flipped the ordering of P and Q. So line one, it was P then Q. Line eight, it says Q then P. We successfully flipped the ordering. Now we just need to make it look back like line eight. So Instead of having disjunctions, we need to have implications. And hopefully, by the process of flipping the disjunctions back into implications, we'll get rid of these negations. This is something that you might just have to cross your fingers and hope that will end up being that way. And in fact, it does end up being that way. Sometimes when you get to these steps, though, you need to just try it and see what happens and hopefully it will work. And if it doesn't work, then try something else. But here, let's just try this. Let's see what we can do here if we flip the ors back into implications and see if things work out nicely. However, before we start flipping things around, you'll notice that the last statement, line 8, has the parentheses around P and R and not around Q and P like in line 5. So before we start changing the implicate rather before we start changing the disjunctions into implications, we need to move the parentheses back around P and R. Fortunately, we can do that because we just have disjunctions here. So by association, we can move the parentheses around not P and R and leave Q or not Q on the outside of the parentheses. So in line six, we have not Q or begin parentheses, not P or R and parentheses. Now we can start using material implication to solve this, to finish this. So let's start doing that by using material implication on the disjunction inside of the parentheses. So remember that when you go from not P or R, you just erase the negation on the first half of it, and you change the V, the OR, into an arrow. So we're back to if P then R on the inside of the parentheses, and what do you know, this matches exactly what you see in line eight, which means we are very close to finishing and doing this correctly. And in fact, if we apply another round of material implication, if we use material implication on the disjunction on the outside of the parentheses, well, we erase the negation on the first part and we change the V into an arrow and lo and behold, we are done. We have shown that line one is the same exact thing as line eight. That's pretty impressive. This was a little bit difficult, but hey, it was helpful and useful to go through this example. And now we know that the, these two things are equivalent and we've proven that these two things are equivalent and we didn't have to bust out a huge truth table that we could have made a bunch of errors on in the process. So this is useful and this is exactly what we're going to be doing later when we get to proofs. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time when we finish up the replacement rules with a couple more for you. Join me then.